There is power in the name of Jesus. Let's declare his name tonight. Praise the hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. Praise the hallelujah louder than the unbelief. Declare it, church. Praise the hallelujah. A melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Sing it out. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my voices roar. church. I raise a hallelujah with everything, with everything inside of me. Raise a hallelujah, raise a hallelujah. The darkness will flee, we'll watch the darkness flee. Sing it out church. I raise a hallelujah. praise tonight.
redeeming what was lost and all that could happen. Oh, this is a healing kind of love. You are the true. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, God with us, be here with me. Wonderful Counselor, the government is resting on your shoulders. For your mercy never fails me And all my days I've been held in your hands 
from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. A faithful God. We couldn't thank you enough, Lord, for all the times we've been unfaithful to you, but you've been faithful. So you never change. You never change. Sing it out with me, church. Walking around these walls. I feel by now before, 
How's everybody doing tonight? Woo, great. I can barely hear you guys. How's everybody doing? That's what I'm talking about. Welcome, everybody, to our midweek study. And uh, for those of you that are watching online, thank you for joining us as well. Um, before we get started with announcements, I just want to know, by a show of hands, is there anybody here at Core Church for the very first time? Like, you've never been here? Oh, we got a hand over here with, with, the, with the cute little baby over there. And any other people raise your hands? Uh, so the, oh, we got another hand right here, you guys. Um, so uh, the usher is going to come by and give you a card. Uh, if you could do us a favor, just fill out the information to let us know that it was your first time with us here uh, at Core Church LA. And we thank you for joining us. And for those of you that are watching online, if it's your first time joining us on the live stream, you go ahead and click that button that says welcome. Let us know that it was your first time here uh, oh, watching with us on the live stream. Now before we get into the announcements, why don't we all get up and say hi to somebody. Say hi to somebody. All right. Oh, there's Pastor Steve. I was like, where did Pastor Steve go? <laughs> um, all right, guys. So uh, before we kick off the rest of the night, we just have one announcement tonight. And this announcement is for anybody who is between the ages of 18 and 35. Where are my 18 and 35-year-olds? Any 18 and 35-year-olds in here? Woo, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. We're, we're, we're really happy with the whoops. Um, well, wait, that's not me anymore. I'm older now. But anyway, um, for you 18 to 35-year-olds, we have a young adults ministry called Zeal. We meet on Friday nights. That's tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Right on, some of those attendees. Uh, so I am personally inviting, I'm the pastor over that ministry. So if you're between the ages of 18 and 35 and you haven't been out, come out. And if you have been out and you never came back, don't worry. The, 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 it, I don't smell anymore. You can come back and, and, and have a good time. So 18 to 35 year olds, come on down tomorrow night at the church here at 7 p.m. Um, with all that said, if you're going to be joining us by worshiping the Lord through the tithes and offerings this evening, there's one of two ways you could do that. You could text Core Church LA to 77977. Uh, for those of you online, you can do the same thing, or you can click on the button that says click here to worship the Lord with tithes and offerings. Uh, but for those of us here in the sanctuary, I'd like to invite the ushers down so we can pray over our offerings and over tonight's message. Father, thank you so much for all that you are to us, all that you are for us. Thank you for being our provider, Lord. And I pray that um, as we give these tithes and offerings to you, Lord, that you would multiply them. Uh, that you would do uh, more with them than we could ever imagine, Lord, for your kingdom and for your glory alone. And God, we also pray for tonight's message that you would speak to every single one of us, God. Rid us of our egos and our pride so that we can hear from your spirit. Speak through Pastor Steve. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. How many know that our God, he is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he's also the lamb who was slain for the sin of the world, to redeem us. So we sing his praise this morning, <laughs> this evening, the lion and the lamb. Let's up a little. Hey.
our God comes to save. The God who comes to save is here to send the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. There is no one who can stop our God. Amen. He is powerful and He is the Lord Almighty. How's everyone doing tonight? All right, there's like three of you that are doing fantastic, awesome. Well, well, hopefully the rest will wake up here. Well, uh, this we have the great privilege tonight of going into Psalm 103. Boy, as I was preparing the study, I'm like, wow, you know, this is just a cool, stinking psalm. You know, can you stay stinking up here? I just did, but anyway. Uh, it's just an awesome psalm. So anyway, we're going to be in Psalm 103 tonight. But before you turn there, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we do just come before you, Lord. Thank you so much for your word, Father. Thank you, God, that David had such a heart to worship you, Lord. And this psalm is just sheer worship and praise to you, Lord. So God, speak to our heart here tonight, Father, as we look at your word. Let us rejoice in it, for we ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Okay, so Psalm 103, I entitled this message, Real Praise. You know, so real praise, what, what, does that, what does that even mean? I think it could mean something different for a lot of people. You know, the word praise in the dictionary means it's an expression of approval it's to show gratitude. Uh, we can do this by praising someone for a good job. Like, hey, man, great job there. But what is real praise? For that means something so much more for us who are true believers in Jesus, our Savior. It means we're to honor, to give our full expression of approval to him to our gracious and merciful God. You know, the Hebrew word for praise means to make a noise of adoration. Uh, it happens in a song of praise. That's why we spend time worshiping here at Core Church. 
and you all partake of it. Amen. Worship is a huge part of the experience of going to church. It's a huge part of us being able to give God something without us asking for something. It's like, it's the only thing he really wants from us is just just worship, just to come before him, to praise him, you know? It, it's just a vital part of our service, and it gives you and me that opportunity to sing out our praises to our glorious God and our Savior. It also allows us to make gestures of praise, like lifting up our hands. You know, some of you might look around like, what are these people lifting their hands for? You know, it's like, you know, maybe you feel a little inhibited with that. One of the reasons that we lower the lights during the worship time is really to have us to focus more. It's kind of, it, we're trying to use that as a stimulant to get us to focus more. You know, having the lights down, maybe not looking around at other people like, uh, you know, hey, where'd that person, how'd they get dressed with the lights on in the closet or did they have the lights off? I can't tell. But anyway, it, it's not to look around at anyone else. It's really to, to really focus on the Lord. So some of the gestures during worship could be closing your eyes. It could be raising your hands. You know, raising your hands is an international sign of surrender. It's just surrendering to the Lord and praising him. And praising who? The one who died, who bled and died for our sins. So that no matter what we have done, no matter how deep our sorrow and pain, no matter how entrenched our guilt and shame might be, we can be delivered we can be forgiven, we can be liberated, and we can be set free. Yes, from our past failures and defeats. Yes, for those who are born again, those who are true believers in Jesus, we have a lot to be thankful for. We have every reason to praise the Lord. In spite of whatever difficulties or setbacks we might be facing today. And look, we all have something kind of weird going on, something maybe not so good, something that's not happening really, uh, whatever. We all have circumstances and difficulties, you know, but we can still lift up our hands and sing with our mouths praise to our great God who's promised us an eternity in heaven one day, and that day could be sooner than any of us could ever imagine. Yet we live in this culture where many are so quick to take credit in praise for themselves, for almost everything they do, while neglecting to take credit for what they've done wrong. That's why many will turn a blind eye to their own failures and their own shortcomings. You know, they'll pass the buck when something happens or shift the blame. But for those who own up to their own faults, you know, uh, that ends up being a good first step in the right direction of really walking with the Lord, with integrity, and with our fellow man. For us as Christians, it's equally important to always give thanks where thanks are due. For that, our culture seems to be a lost art on that. For many in our day and age are only concerned with, well, thanking themselves. <laughs> Consider how many award shows that we have created here in America. You know, we have, we have, you know, the Oscars, the Emmys, you know, the ESPYs, you know, the Golden Globes, the MTV Awards, Grammys, Country Music Awards, the People's Choice Awards, the Billboard Awards, Hip Hop. There's over 30 more award shows that we try to honor ourselves and how wonderful we are. Yes, it's safe to say that people, they like to be praised by others. People also like to win. They like to get the pat on the back. Face it, most people like attention to themselves. Now, there's nothing wrong with getting recognized for doing a good job. I mean, if you do a good job, I mean, it's good to be recognized. Hey, man, that was a good job. I tell people here at the church all the time, and they do a good job. I mean, that's like, that's awesome. We just got our tracks back. You know, we, were, we ran out, so we printed up a lot more. But before we printed them up, I had Alicia here. You know, she does all of our artwork here. She kind of gave it a facelift, and what a fantastic job she did on it. So we have them in the back, so if you need some more, you know, 
uh, some more tracks. We have them to hand out to people, you know. But uh, so when you look, when you do a good job, it's good to tell somebody that. There's nothing wrong with that. But we don't need to be praised on and on and on for whatever we do. You know, it's been said the biggest challenge after success is shutting up about it, <laughs> end quote. <laughs> Yet some have not mastered that quality. Consider what Madonna said at one point. She said this quote, I won't be happy until I'm um, as famous as God. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, Madonna, you know, she's 65 now, and uh, she hasn't become as famous as God yet, but she's still trying, you know, she's still out there doing concerts, so she's 65, so just a couple days ago, she was in Seattle, and she fell out of a chair on stage, you know, uh, I don't think her comparing herself to God's working out too good for her, but anyway, just saying. Uh, James Brown, uh, you know, he says this quote, uh, this is before he passed away, he said, I've, I've outdone anyone you can name. Mozart, Beethoven, Bach, I've wrote 5,500 tunes. He also followed in their footsteps, of course, of Mozart, Beethoven, and Bach, because he's no longer with us. <laughs> the Bible says it's a point for every man to die once, and after this comes judgment. But anyway, yes, those who praise themselves the most have never heard this quote. There's no need to boast of your accomplishments and what you can do. A great man is known... He needs no introduction. It's always good to let others pat you on the back, not yourself. Yet some will give glory to God, uh, you know, and that's good. But is it really true when they're giving glory to God? You know, Katy Perry, uh, who used to be Katie Hudson, she kind of grew up in the Christian uh, artist when she was a young teenager. And I had her come out and sing it. Uh, harvest when I was doing the music and teaching the main Sunday night service there. So her name was Katie Hudson, and then she changed it to Katy Perry. But her mom came to me there with Katie right there. She was like 15, I think. And she's like, you know, my daughter wants to go to L.A. and live there by herself and, you know, and you know, pursue her music career. I'm like, don't do it. Don't let, her, don't let her do it. And Katie's looking at me with, you know, daggers in her eyes, you know. And uh, her mom ended up letting her do it. And the next thing you know, she kissed a girl. Well, I'm just saying the song, I kissed a girl. But anyway, but she said this at one point, you know, after she had kind of started getting famous and everything. She says, quote, I'm so blessed to have grown up in the church. It began my singing career. Knowing this gives me a communion with God when I sing. And she added, I believe in faith and I believe it's pure. And it's just kind of like, okay, I mean, it sounds good, but what is having faith if, it, if you don't really live it out? You know, it's like she's lived with multiple guys and you know, she married Russell Brand, you know, and was living with him for a while. Then she's been living with Orlando Bloom. Then they were going to get married, didn't get married. I don't, not, not sure where they're at. They have a kid, you know. And, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, uh, people will praise God, and I'm glad this, and I have faith, and, but, but yet you're not living it. it. It's not shown in your life, you know. It, it's one thing to profess it. It's another thing to live that faith out. But for the true believer... We're all called to give glory where glory is due. The Bible says in James 1.16, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from God, from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Yes, when people have gifts, like you see someone beautiful that has a beautiful voice and they're very talented, well, did they just come up with that themselves? Did they decide in their mother's womb, like, I'm going to be beautiful, and I'm going to have a beautiful voice, and I'm going to sing and become this, or I'm going to become an actress, or I'm going to be seven feet tall, or six foot nine, and I'm going to play basketball. I mean, did they really have all of that, or was those gifts given to them? Every single person that has gifts or talents, you know, and all of you have gifts and talents. We all have little things that we do that we, maybe we're good at. You know, I do a lot of upgrades on my house. I work on my motorcycle. I work on cars. I mean, you know, I, I don't pay people for anything. I pretty much do it all myself. It, but, but God helped me with all of these gifts and talents of doing things so I don't have to pay others to do them. You know, so, it, but it, God, I give God all the glory. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I was sitting there working on a car not knowing what exactly I was doing, 
But I was just praying the whole time. I remember when we first got married, I had an overhead cam four-cylinder engine in our little truck and blew a head gasket. And I'm just like, oh, what am I going to do? We didn't have any money. I mean, it's like, so I went down and bought a head gasket, you know, for like whatever. It was probably 15 bucks or something, 20 bucks back then. You know, this is way back when we first got married. This is 45 years ago. And, and I remember just sitting out there. It was uh, in August and it was just boiling hot. It was like 110 degrees. And I sat out there all day and I took that head off and that overhead cam. And I put a new head gasket on. I put it all back together and I was just praying the whole time. And it's like, I'd never done that before, but you know, the Lord gave me the gifts and talents to do it. So do I, do I pat myself on the back for that? No, it's like God gave me the ability of, you know, how is this going to come apart? Well, let me see. Let me, let me put it back together the way that it came apart. And this is before you had cell phones and everything where you could take a picture, take a picture like, okay, how did that go again? Let me look at the picture. No, this is before all of that. So we should be thanking God. If we're good at something, great. I'm glad you're good at what you do. But thank God for those gifts. Yes, God gave them to us. Amen. The ability to do what we do. And those, again, that are successful, they're because God gave us the ability to grow that talent inside of us. So shouldn't we thank God for the gifts and the talents that we might possess? Yes, the Lord reminds us of what we should already know when talking, you know, uh, or when taking credit you know, about ourselves. It says in Deuteronomy 8, 17, it says, otherwise you may say in your heart, my power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. But you shall remember that the Lord your God, for it is he who has given you the power to make wealth. You know, so some people are just naturally good with money. Okay, that naturally good with money means that they have the ability to think down the road. And, and so again, that's just a gift that God has given us. Know this, God is not against us becoming successful. It's actually quite the opposite. For working hard and doing our job as under the Lord and pleasing him with our lives will many times be followed by God's great blessings. Listen to Ecclesiastes 2.24 says, there is nothing better for a man or a woman than eat and drink and tell themselves that their labor is good. This also I have seen that it is from the hand of God for who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him. And that's so true. Yes, Max Lucado, he's a pastor and an author. He said this quote, the maker of the stars would rather die for you than live without you. And that is a fact. So if you need to brag, you feel like you just have to brag, brag about him. That's it. Don't brag about yourself. Brag about God. Well, tonight, as we continue in this study through the book of Psalms, we can reflect on how grateful we are or how grateful we should be. Yes, I know there are many things that are around us that are unstable. There's things in our world that are so insecure right now. Oh, my goodness, we're surrounded by that. But our salvation is not one of them. Think about that. With all the things that are unstable around us, one thing that is not unstable is the fact and the foundation of our salvation, because our God will never, ever leave us or forsake us. Our forgiveness is real, and he will never forget it, and our redemption is drawing near, nearer than we could ever imagine. So it's never a bad time to always be able, as a believer, to give glory and honor to our Heavenly Father. Amen? Yes. So tonight, as we look at Psalm 103, we will consider three points in light of our title, Real Praise. Number one, blessing the Lord. Wow. Let's just bless the Lord tonight. I mean, let's just like, let's just give honor and glory to him. Number two, having compassion. God will always have compassion on us. That is, he is willing to suffer with us, to come alongside us in no matter what situation we are in. And number three, obeying his word. He wants us just to obey him. Well, let's look at our first point, blessing the Lord. As we read together, starting in Psalm 103, we'll pick up, of course, in verse 1. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. 
Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all of our iniquities, who heals all our diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. And the Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the sons of Israel. We'll stop there for a moment. So this is a psalm of David, David the psalmist. And David, like each and every true believer today, he owed his life to the Lord God. He was just a shepherd boy. I mean, that was like the lowest level of the totem pole when it came to the workforce. He was just a shepherd boy on his own. He would have just been a, a blip on the map of history. No one would have ever talked about him. But because of God's graciousness, because of God's merciful hand, David became more than he could have ever become on his own, more than he could have ever dreamed. He became the man after God's own heart. He became the giant slayer. He became the deliverer of the weak. He became a man of worship and prayer, a man who truly walked with God, a man who's known by the majority of the human race throughout all time. So what can we glean from this man after God's own heart? It's like, wow. So you realize like, wow, David was great. And you know, you think like, well, I could never be like a David. I mean, David, I mean, he was the man. I mean, he, he was just so used by God, but yet David was only able to become David because of God because he allowed God to work in and through him. What in the world could happen in your life if you simply allowed the Lord to work in and through you? If you simply allowed, when you got that nudge of the Holy Spirit to go talk to someone to do this or whatever, and you just really started praying and God, Lord, I just want your will to be done in my life. Gee, what could God do? Well, listen, <laughs> let me tell you, a lot more than what you think he would do, I can tell you that. But what can we glean from him in verse 1? He said, bless the Lord, O my soul. That word bless is used seven times here in Psalm 103. Seven times. That's more than any of the other 150 psalms. Now, in the original Hebrew language, bless means to greatly praise, salute, and thank. And in this case... It's the Lord. Notice, David does it from his soul, from the very core of his being, from all that was within him, from the very fiber of his existence. This was not some modest, informal, lifeless, faint-hearted lip service of praise to God here. No, man, this is from deep down. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. I mean, it was like something from down deep, you know, because if you just give some life lift, yes, praise Jesus. It's like, that is almost like an insult to the God of creation who created us in his image and literally came to die for the sin of all humanity. Yes, David's heart is engaged. It was passionate his heart was burning on fire with praise, for there is so much to rejoice in. Consider why David was so thankful. He said in verse 2, after using the word bless or greatly praise for the third time, it was for all of God's benefits, meaning praise him for all of his earthly gifts that he has given to us in the here and now. And David goes on to list just a few of them. He said in verse 3, who pardons all our sins. Did you notice that it wasn't? Well, he pardons some of them. Well, he, he kind of gets you a hall pass on a few. No, he says he pardons all our sins. All of them, not some. Could you imagine 
if God said, all right, I'm going to forgive you for 10 sins in your life. Well, that wouldn't last too long. We, you know, first week, we'd all be biting the dust. Uh, he, what, what if he said, well, I'm going to pardon the first 100 of your sins? What if it was like, all right, in your lifetime, I will forgive you 1,000 times? You might be surprised how fast you go through those. <laughs> then what? Then would we be banished, separated from him forever, from the presence of God? But that's not the case. God has promised to forgive all of our sins. I mean, stop and think of the, of the magnitude of that just for a moment. The magnitude. And again, you know, here's David. He's all happy and cheerful writing this psalm. I mean, he's just, oh, let's just bless the Lord. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like David had a miserable life through most of his life. I mean, let's not forget, you know, King Saul chased him through the desert for who knows, 15, 17 years trying to kill him because he was jealous of him. I mean, David's life was no cakewalk. Yes, he ended up becoming the undisputed king of Israel. He ended up being the greatest king that Israel ever had. But it wasn't without a bunch of hiccups in there. There was problems. There was issues. There were sin issues on David's hand. There was other issues of people being jealous and trying to topple his kingdom. I mean, there was all kinds of issues. But through it all, he could say, praise the Lord. You know, so he had circumstances that were sour. He had things that turned upside down. He had miserable moments, but yet he could praise the Lord. Yes, everything that we've done, you know, in our life has been forgiven and wiped away, washed away. But now because he bore our sin, Jesus, on his sinless body, we stand pure and holy before God. Imagine that. I mean, we actually stand righteous and justified before God, and we had nothing to do with that. I mean, it's not because, well, I'm just such a wonderful person. Look how sweet I am, you know? I'm like the whole bag of Cool Ranch chips. It's like, uh, no, no. It's like, you might be good at times, and I'm sure you are, and you might be sweet at times. That's great. But it's like, on a whole, no, we do things wrong. I mean, we, we think bad things, you know? We just, you know, we, we mess up, but yet... God looks at us because of his grace, his unmerited favor. He looks at us as if we've never sinned. It's amazing. You know, one day when we die, and we're all going to die one day, we're going to stand before the living God. And we will approach his throne, and we, have, we will have no fear of death, of being cast into hell. I mean, we can approach the throne of God boldly, the Bible says. I wonder if every one of you have that hope here tonight. I mean, do you know that you know that your sin is forgiven? If not, don't leave here tonight without getting right with the Lord. But then he goes on to say, amen. And he goes on to say, uh, you know, and he heals all of our diseases. Now, he's not referring to physical diseases here, though God is capable of healing physical diseases. But David has already put this in the context of his soul, okay? Verse 1 and 2. So God has healed the diseases of his soul, the disease of hatred and anger. And that can be a disease because it can eat at you inside. Boy, have you ever just hated someone? Someone double-dogged you? Someone messed around with you? Someone caused misery in you? Someone took your job? Someone blamed you for something? You had to eat it because of someone else? You ever had that anger inside, that hatred inside? Oh, my goodness, it can eat at you like it's just unbelievable. Every time you see the person, Argh. every time you hear their name, oh, I hate that person. You're not going to believe what they did to me. You lay in bed at night. You're turmoil over it. But he says, God has healed me of the disease of hatred and anger, of bitterness and jealousy. Oh, bitterness and jealousy. Oh, man, that can eat, eat you up. How come that guy gets the new car? I deserve the new car. Why did he get the raise? Why is this happening to me? Why did this other person, you know, get a house? I need a house. It's like, what about fear and anxiety? 
Oh, my goodness. When you're healed of fear and anxiety, oh, when you're filled with fear and anxiety, it'll eat you up inside. What's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen. I could die. I don't know what's going to happen. Oh, my goodness. I watch some people on airplanes because, you know, I travel a lot. And, you know, some people, are, they're taking off. You just see them. They're, they're just white knuckles. There's a, ha, ah, ha. Ah, and I'm just like, take it easy. <laughs> it's like, it's, we're going to. Take off and we'll land. I mean, you're, you'll be fine, you know. But but when you're filled with fear and anxiety, it, you know, it's like someone else is looking at them like you. You got to be kidding me. But but yet that person, it, they're beside themselves. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And so he's saying, "You've healed me of this of guilt and doubt." Yes, God is a soothing balm of healing to the human soul because all of these things that I talked about here—bitterness, jealousy fear, anxiety, hatred, guilt, doubt, all of those things will eat us up inside. And I guarantee you that every one of us here have dealt with some of these things in our life. Every one of us. And you know, they can eat away at you. They can keep you up at night. They can steal your sleep from you. But God can heal the human soul. Not only to David, but to each and every one of us who call upon the name of the Lord. Yes, like it said in verse 4, God has redeemed us. He's bought us back from the pit of hardship and despair. And he has crowned us with his loving kindness and his compassion, he says. And that, of course, is God's favor. It's his mercy. It's his pity towards us, towards us who are in need. Is anyone here tonight battling with something? I mean, battling with an issue, battling with something where a war is waging on within your own soul. Maybe you find yourself weary and tired and it's like, man, I just, I can't take this anymore. Maybe you're getting ready to just burn out and give up. And if you are, don't, don't give up. Keep moving forward. Pick up and go. Tomorrow's a new day. Don't lose hope. God loves you. He said in verse 5 that he can satisfy our lives, that we can be renewed inside like an eagle. You know, the eagle obviously is a, America's, you know, a national bird. It's a sign of freedom. It's a sign of strength and speed, which likens itself to youth. And have we really thought about how gracious God has been to us, even in the midst of maybe some sour circumstances we might be going through right now? I mean, how he's forgiven us of our sin, how he's healed our souls and given us strength for tomorrow. Which brings up our second point, having compassion. Let's read next here, picking up in verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger. If you got a Bible? Underline that. He is slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. Think about that. He's slow to anger. See, sometimes, you know, we mess up and we mess up again and we're just like, oh, you know, and, and we just beat ourselves up and beat ourselves up. And God's like, well, wait a minute. Why are you so angry at yourself? I'm slow to anger, but I'm great in a loving kindness. And he will not always strive with us nor will he keep his anger forever. Uh, he has not dealt with us according to our sin. Because if he did, he'd just wipe us off the face of the map. Here, how about a lightning bolt right between your eyes, okay? Nor has he rewarded us according to our iniquities. Because if he rewarded us according to our sin, again, he'd have to send fire down from heaven and consume us. Verse 11, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he has removed our transgression and sin from us. Verse 13, just as the father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame, and he's mindful that we're just but dust. I mean, it's like we make bad decisions sometimes. We do really stupid things. Verse 15, as for man, his days are like grass. 
as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. And when the wind has passed over it, it is no more. Meaning it's like it's here, it's beautiful one day, and it's gone the next. And his place, he acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. That's the third time he says, for those who fear him. Did you notice that? And his righteousness to his children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them. So who is he loving kindness to? Who is he you know, pouring all this grace and everything on? To those who remember his precepts, his laws, his commandments, to do them, to obey them, to do what he says. So, yes, God will not always strive with man. One day, this age of grace is going to be over, and God's judgment is going to repay all of humanity around us for the rejection of his great love. So you see this whole liberal movement. You see all this craziness out there. You see people mocking God, living in sin, and prospering at the moment. And you see that, and it's just, you know, you want to go beat your head against the wall? Well, just know, they're not getting away with this. Every man will reap, every woman will reap what they sow. Everyone will reap what they sow. And it's safe to say that the rapture of the church, boy, it's at hand. I mean, it could happen in any moment. It could happen 20 years from now. It could happen tonight. And once the rapture of the, yeah, amen. And once the rapture of the church happens, the apocalypse, boy, it's going to begin. And it'll end with the battle of Armageddon. It's going to happen just as God said it would happen from the very beginning. Once the church is removed, the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. It says, behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, meaning we're not all going to die. He says, but we will all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the trumpet of God, and the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. So he's saying that the rapture is going to happen in a moment like, like we're living right now. It's going to happen, and not everyone's going to die, because if the rapture happens tonight or it happens tomorrow, and you know, God willing, we're all alive this year. If it happens at the end of the year, it's like we're taken away. So we actually don't face physical death. We'll be like Elijah didn't face physical death, and Enoch in Genesis 5 didn't face physical death. So yes, the true body of believers will be taken away, raptured, caught up to be with the Lord. And as soon as that happens, as soon as that happens, this world gets what they want. Because what does the liberal agenda want right now? They want a godless society. Don't tell us what to do. We want to do whatever we want to do. And we want to rule the world. Okay, fine. You're going to get that. You want a godless society? You're going to get exactly what you want. And it'll start when the rapture of the church happens. And then that's when God will unfold the great seven-year tribulation period that he spends the whole book of Revelation unfolding and giving us great detail on what happens there. And during that time, God is going to judge the world for its rebellion against him. The people who say that this life is hell on earth right now, they have no concept of the judgment that's coming. Say, we're truly all hell will break loose on the earth during the seven-year tribulation period. We're wild animals. All wild animals right now have a natural fear of man. Now, sure, every now and then you hear a grizzly bear attack someone or a mountain lion attack someone, but normally when they hear humans, animals take off the other way. But that's going to all change after the rapture happens. Wild animals will attack and eat humans. They will no longer fear man. They will come after man. Imagine giant eagles coming down and clawing your head. I mean, it's like things will happen. To the abyss opening up, the Bible says the abyss will open up and creatures that have never been seen before will attack man. They'll have teeth of a lion, a tail of a scorpion. And I mean, they'll come and they'll have poison in them. And yet man will not be able to die. They just won't be able to move. And in that time, two-thirds of the earth's water will turn to blood. Hailstones of fire will fall from the sky. It will be worse than anyone could ever imagine. This is why it's so important to humble ourselves before God and to fear him. Remember, in our text we just read, he said, 
All of these benefits are to those who fear him. He said it three times. Verse 11 says, those who fear him exalt in his loving kindness. To fear God is really two things. This is how you fear God. Number one, fearing God is a reverence to God. It's to honor him. It's revering him. But number two, it's to have a healthy fear of God. Like, I want to walk with God. I don't want to walk with sin because I don't want to go to hell in a handbasket, okay? So one is to revere God, but the other is just to have a good, healthy fear of God. I don't want to face God in him in his wrath. I want to face God with him in his grace and his mercy. Now, some people say, I could never serve a Christian God. I mean, how could I ever love and praise a God that I have to fear? That is so ridiculous, It's like we have so many healthy fears in life, and we don't talk anything bad about those. I mean, we fear fire, do we not? I mean, if there's a big old bonfire gone, do you want to just go jump in the middle and stand it? Hey, let me see how long I can stand in that bonfire. I remember when I was a youth pastor, we took a bunch of pallets down to Newport Beach on one of the fire rings. We're going to have a big worship night and what have you. And so I thought, well, let's just pile on a bunch of pallets. So we had like 10 solid oak pallets, you know, so we put like 10 of them up and we lit them on fire. It, it's like, it, it's like 50 feet high flames. I mean, it was like, oh, anyway, well, anyway, I, 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 who's in charge here? Uh, I am. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think somebody else. I think that 15 year old's in charge anyway, but uh, yeah, we, we lit up the beach. Let's just say that. But I just remember how hot that fire was. I remember we were all standing back about 50 feet because that fire was super hot. But anyway, uh, we we have a healthy fear of fire, don't we? You don't turn your stove on and put your your hand in it. No, you you know fire is good when it's controlled. And if it's not controlled, it's not good. Okay, so we have a healthy fear of fire. Okay, we have a healthy fear of not standing on a train track when a train's coming. Okay, it's like, that's a healthy fear. Like, get off the train track, the train is coming. Okay, we have a healthy fear of an airplane crash. That's why many people will pray, Lord, just let this airplane go where it's going, okay? Just let it land and, you know, let us get there and let us get back, you know? So we have all kinds of healthy fears. The Bible saying is you need to have a healthy fear of God because if you don't have a healthy fear of God and you just blow him off, guess what? You're going to stand in judgment one day and you'll have to give an account of everything you've done in your life. Jesus said this about death. He said in Luke 12, 5, he says, but I will warn you whom to fear. So here's Jesus saying, there's one thing you need to fear in life, and this is it. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has the authority to cast you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. But again, this is what people don't understand. If you fear God, you fear nothing else. If you don't fear God, you'll fear everything else. I don't know what's going to happen. What's going to happen when I die? Uh, I don't know what's going to happen here. Oh, I'm, I fear of this guilt and shame. Well, this could happen. And that could happen. And oh, I don't want to take off an airplane. It might blow up in the air. It's like you fear everything. But when you fear God, you don't fear anything else. Because he says, don't fear. <laughs> don't fear anything else. When you trust in him, you don't have to fear anything else. So when you're walking to your car in the middle of a parking lot that is pitch black at night, you don't have to fear. It's like, Lord, just put your angel's guard around me. Just get me to the car. Just just get me there. Just make it happen. You know, that's it. So anyway, that's a, that's a good thing. But consider how David describes God's love for us. First in verse 11, it's as high as the heavens. How about that? How how high is God's love for you? It's as high as the heavens. How about that? Second in verse 12, he removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. How far is that? Well, you know, if you get in an airplane and, you know, you say take off out of LAX here, fly over the Pacific Ocean, you know, you kind of hit Hawaii and then you'll hit Japan, then you'll hit China, you know, and you just keep going west. And guess what? You can just go west for as far as you want to go. Like how far is the east is from the west? It's infinity. See, if you go north, you go north, 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 yeah, Washington, Canada, you know, no, Alaska, the North Pole, look, there's Santa Claus. Wait, he didn't exist, sorry. Anyway, and then all of a sudden, oh, now you're going south. Okay, now you're going south. Oh, there's the penguins, Antarctica, oh, now you're going north. Okay, but east and west, 
It's forever. So when he's saying he takes your sin as far as the east is from the west, it's forever and ever. And third, in verse 12, it's as tender as a father who has compassion and pity on his own children. Now, look, there's some bad dads out there. Granted, you know, there is. And if you got stuck with a bad dad, I'm sorry. You know, but if you have a compassionate dad, let me tell you, that dad will die for his kids. Man, he'll love his kids. You know, he'll do whatever he has to do for those kids. And he's saying, man, your father in heaven, man, he has compassion and pity on you like a compassionate father does. Again, how is all of this possible? How can we be assured that God will really remove our sin as far as the east is from the west? I like what the Bible says in Colossians 2.13. It says, when you were dead in your sin and the uncircumcision of your flesh, when you were dead, I was dead. Like I, I was sold out to my own sin. I was living in sin. I just was completely enraptured in it. I mean, I was addicted to it. He says, but yet he made you alive together with him. And yet he changed me. I became born again. It's like he took me out of that lifestyle. He said, having forgiven us of all of our transgressions. I mean, by the time I was 18, I had racked up so many sins in my life that I was filled with guilt and shame inside. And yet God took all that away in a moment, a twinkling of an eye. It was just done. It was gone. I was reborn. It was like, what just happened to me? Like, I just remember thinking to myself, what happened? Like, Something happened. Like, I don't know what happened. I can't even explain what happened, but I'm, I'm telling you something happened. I remember driving home that night and asking the Lord in my heart like another 50 times, like, Lord, I don't know what happened, but I, I, I want you. Yes, I want you, you know. He goes on to say in Colossians 2, verse 14, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile towards us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So he says, you had a certificate of debt, and that certificate, certificate of debt was hostile towards you. Now, if you haven't heard this before, this is an, a, a wonderful portion of Scripture. And the analogy that's made here is just spectacular. Because in the, the Roman days... In Roman imprisonment, this is what was happening since Rome was a world governing empire 2,000 years ago when this book was written in Colossian, uh, in Colossae, to the Colossians. Anyway, so if you were you know, put in prison for something, they gave you a certificate of debt. And it says, you have done this wrong, okay? You, uh, you, know, you, you hurt someone, you, know, you, you, you stole something, you're a thief, and, and you're going to get two years in prison for that or whatever it was. So they would give you a certificate of debt that you did that. Now, they would nail that to the cell of, your, of the prison that you were in. And so you sat there for two years, five years, 10 years, whatever your sentence was. But once your sentence was up and you paid your five years, they would stamp that certificate of debt and say, paid in full, and they would hand it to you. So then you're back out in culture and society. Someone sees you and says, hey, you're the one that stole my donkey, okay? It's like, wait, uh, they, they pull out their certificate. I went to prison for five years for that stinking donkey, okay? I paid my debt. It's paid in full. Oh, okay. So what, what the Bible is saying here is we had a certificate of debt of not just stealing a donkey. It's of every sin you've ever done. So for some of you, it's like the old phone books they used to have. Now, if you're young, you don't even know what a phone book is, you know, okay? But hey, before cell phones, they used to have phone books, and they were like this thick, okay? So, you know, those of you that are older, you know what they are. And I mean, you know, they had everyone's name in there, everyone's phone number. That's what you had to do. That Look up, okay, Abigail, you know, Cranhauser, you know, okay, okay, where's the Cranhausers at? Okay, nah, 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 you know, and so it's like, so we had a certificate of debt, and it was all filled out, and it was nailed to the cross of Jesus, and it's paid in full. So he took your certificate of debt, and it's been paid in full. Yes, we exalt and praise the living God who died for us because we know that he's taken our sin as far as the east is from the west. For he has compassion on us like a father has compassion on his own children. Know this, the love will carry us from this temporal fading life to the eternal life, everlasting glory. That's where we're going. 
He's going to get us there. And it, I mean, there's going to be a few bruises. We're going to stumble every now and then. We're going to fall down, but he's going to get us there, which brings up our third and final point, obeying his word. Let's read what it says, picking up in verse 19. It says, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you who serve him, doing his will. Bless the Lord, all you works of his in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Wow. And again, every time he says that, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, it's from the deepest part of the core of his being, from deep down inside, passionately. David establishes that the throne of God is above all things that are seen and unseen, that his sovereignty, his power, his glory rules over all. And now, as he brings this wonderful psalm to an end, he has a passionate plea for all the angels and the hosts of heaven to bless the Lord. They're to greatly praise. I mean, here's David. He's walking so close with the Lord that he's exhorting angels to bless the Lord, you know, the God of all creation. We're told that there are 10,000 times 10,000 angels, so there's millions of angels, and there are hosts of heaven, probably referring to now cherubim circling the throne of God as they cry out, holy, 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 you know, to the Lord God Almighty. Yes, David cries out again from the core of his being. He exhorts all of heaven to bless and honor greatly in praise our loving, merciful God. For we are his workmanship. The earth is his creation. Yes, he is worthy of our praise. He is the maker of all things, including us. And those who refuse to worship him now, those who refuse, I don't want to hear, no, 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 don't tell me about God. I don't want to hear. I don't believe it. Get out of my face. It's like, they are going to bow down and worship him on judgment day. But then guess what? It's too late for them. Oh, they'll bow down. This is what it says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. It says, for this reason also God highly exalted Jesus and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So yes, uh, for the believer, oh my goodness, one day we're going to stand before the Lord. We're going to look into his eyes and the glory of just heaven all around us, and, and we're going to know him as our Father, for we are his sons and his daughters, and he will know every single one of us by first name. And we will worship him with the angels and the hosts of heaven. Yet for the non-believer, for the one who rejected to the one person who doesn't want to hear it, to the person who wants to live in sin, they love sin more than anything else, they will worship for only a short moment because they will bow down. Their knee will bow. And they will say, yes, Jesus is Lord. And they will say that only to be told, now depart from me, you cursed creature from my presence. How sad. How horrible. Christ died for their sins, but they didn't accept it. Yet, they refused to believe. I wonder if there's anyone here who's maybe not totally right with the Lord right now. Maybe you've slipped away and you've kind of become that prodigal son or prodigal daughter. You know, well, listen, like I said earlier, today is your day. The God of creation is calling you to repent, to turn from your sin, to be cleansed to be set free, to start a new life in Christ, to be forgiven. You know, my dad just passed away, and I was, uh, we, we left after the second service on Sunday, and we flew back to Florida, and I ended up doing the memorial service for my dad. And it was, just, it was really hard for me because uh, all my family there, and just, you know, I don't know where they're all at. And it's, you know, they've heard me preach the gospel like, you know, a, a thousand times, more times than I'm sure they ever wanted. And you know, it's just, it's hard, you know, because you're sitting there and, you know, this one's living that lifestyle, that one's living that lifestyle, and, you know, I don't, I don't even know, and, 
you know, it's like I, I wanted to go hard on this, and I'm just like, well, I, you know, I said it, you know, but it's just like they, they've heard it, you know. So I, I don't know where they're at. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure, so I have to leave it in God's hands. But I'm telling you, if you're here tonight, you're not right with God, you need to get right with God. You need to turn from your sin, you know. You need to be forgiven. You need to have your shame washed away. You know, you can change, you know. We were all created to, to give him glory, honor, and great praise. And notice in verse 22, it says, you know, we end where we started. As David says, with a passion and zeal, he cries out, bless the Lord, O my soul. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just come before you, Lord, and thank you so much for this opportunity to get right with you here today and to, you know, just praise you and to honor you and to read your word, Father, and Lord, I had the great privilege years ago to lead my dad to the Lord. And, uh, and Lord, here now, he's, he's in your presence now. And so I'm just thankful for that, Lord. He had some ups and downs, but, you know, he believed in you. And I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful I'll, I'll see him again. But, Lord, maybe someone here is not sure where they're at. And it's just like, I can tell you this, death is real. If you're younger, you don't think it's ever going to happen to you, but it happens to people all the time, every day. People are dying. You know, some people live a full life like my dad did. He was 87. Some people are teenagers and they die. It's just, you know, we never know. We don't know when it's our time. But the thing that we have to be ready for is to be ready to meet our maker. And if you're not in that place tonight and you're not sure where you would be if if you were to die tonight, look, I, I pray that no one would die tonight. I pray that you all live many more years. But hey, we live in LA. Crazier things have happened. People die here all the time. So if you're not right with God and you need to get right with him, this is your moment. Because the Bible says wherever two or more are gathered in his presence, he is right there. So the Lord's here. I mean, we're in church. You'd expect the Lord to be here, right? Well, he is here. It's not just a uh, a platitude. I mean, God is here. He dwells within the praises of his people. So God is here and you're here. And if you're not right with the Lord and you've got some open sin in your life, are you willing to turn from that sin? You know, look, I mean, we all have a host of things that, man, we've got issues. And God is like saying, are you willing for me to come in your life and start working in those issues? And if you are, and God is like saying, come home, get right with me. So if that's you, and you're like, Pastor, I need to get right with the Lord. I, Pastor, I, I want my sin forgiven. I want to know when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. If that's you, then with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, you just raise up your hand. I want to pray for you here tonight. All right, this is your moment. All right. God bless you. God bless you in the front. God bless you in the back. Anybody else? All right. God bless you in the back. The Lord sees you. Anyone else? All right. You can put your hands down. I want to lead you in this prayer. And, you know, look, this is a prayer that you might think, well, you know, how do I know God's going to hear me? Well, I'll tell you what, God, when you're serious about this prayer, there, there is no prayer that the Bible says that the angels in heaven rejoice when one person in sin turns from that sin. Okay, so th this is the one thing that the Bible says, look, the, all heaven rejoices in this. So God will absolutely hear this prayer. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. I don't care if you've prayed it before. God's love for you will never end. And so he'll, he'll meet you right where you're at. So I want to lead you in this prayer. And if you're watching online, you know, you could be in another state. You could be here in L.A. You could be two miles from the church. You could be halfway around the world. If you need to get right with Christ, you want your sin forgiven, and you're willing to turn from your sin, you pray this prayer with us, and God will hear you wherever you're at. So pray this now. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I believe that you died for me. I believe that they buried you in a grave. I believe that you rose again from the dead. 
And I'm asking, Lord, walk with me. Come inside me. Help me with the things that I struggle with. Help me to follow you. Be my Lord. Be my God. Be my Savior. And be my friend. And fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. God bless you. So glad you came to church tonight. Listen, if you don't have one of these, this is a New Believer's Bible. It's, uh, it's an easy-to-read English. It's just a New Testament. Uh, it's got, you know, about 40 pages up front. talks about what it means to walk with God. So it's good to read that. Like, well, what should I do? Like, you know, do I just wake up tomorrow and do the same thing I did today? Well, maybe not. You know, maybe you need to change some things in your life so that you start really walking with Him. So it gives you some pointers there. And so there's a lot of good info in here, notes on almost every other page. We've got some materials that we printed up here for you also. So as soon as we sing this last song, once that's over, please come up. This is Pastor Abel. He was given the announcements tonight. He teaches our, you know, zeal ministry on Friday nights. That's tomorrow night at 7. And, uh, but come up and see him. He'll make sure you get a copy. He'll pray with you, you know, talk with you, you know. So come up and see him uh, right afterwards. So let's stand up. Man, the Lord bless you. Thanks for coming to church tonight. Oh, I forgot. Hey, you guys are online. If you want to get these materials too, uh, you just seen a screen pop up and you can text us at 323-807-3255 or you can email us at bible at corechurchla.com and we will get these materials to you also. And this isn't a thing where you have to like, you know, send in a you know, a gift for any amount. This is like, no, this is a gift from us, from the people that come, that come to Core Church here to you. They purchase them for you. So it's a gift. So if you want to support our ministry, that's separate of this. This is a free gift. So anyway, text us, email us, and we'll get those materials to you. Well, with all of that said, God bless each and every one of you. And uh, thanks for coming tonight. Let's uh, worship. <laughs> God bless you, family. We'll see you Sunday. Have a beautiful evening. Thank you.